Some actors begin performing at a very young age, while others leave high school for the bright lights and big city. But very few graduate from college, build a successful career in finance, handling mergers and acquisitions, and then pursue a career in film and television. That is a diamond in the rough, and that diamond is our featured guest today, Yvonne Chapman. Born in Alberta, Canada, Yvonne moved from Calgary to Vancouver around 2015 to begin her acting career and almost immediately landed a recurring role in Single and Dating in Vancouver. After a few shorts and TV movies, she began booking coveted roles as a regular on Canadian series like Street Legal and Family Law. Then, in 2021, she became the main villain on the CW's hit series, Kung Fu, playing the sophisticated assassin, Jalan. Coming soon, she will inhabit the role of legendary warrior Avatar Kyoshi in the highly anticipated live-action Netflix series, Avatar The Last Airbender. Recently, I sat down with the Canadian native to discuss life in Vancouver, mastering the elements in The Last Airbender, and of course, all things Kung Fu. Today, we are super happy to have Yvonne Chapman with us. Yvonne, welcome to Everything Zen. Hi, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. Thrilled to be here. Growing up in Heartland territory of Calgary, Alberta, what was young Yvonne like? And what films do you remember being most influential as a kid? Wow, I really like that description. (laughs) Heartland, for sure. Um, I, growing up, was really shy, really shy. And um, I I say that because people always ask me, like, when did this whole thing about acting start? And I'm like, yeah, it started when I was really young, but I was just really shy. I never really thought I could do it until later on in life. But I would say one of the movies that pops up to my mind, um, it, it was so, I watched it so many times. So when I was little, my mom, remember Roger's video and Blockbuster? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Of so my yeah. So my mom would always bring me to Rogers video, and like we go through the movies. But the only movie I ever wanted to watch was All Dogs Go to Heaven. Classic. 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 And the people there were so lovely. I remember they had this little corner set up for me all the time. They like plopped me down. They made popcorn for me, and I just sit there as like a five year old kid just watching All Dogs Go to Heaven. And my mom's like, "Don't you want anything else?" And she's like, "No." Nope. I just want this movie, and that was the one that um, really stuck with me in, in my childhood. Well, that's great. Now, now, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I read that you didn't get into acting until after you left college, maybe had a few courses in college, um, that you were in a nine-to-five type of business job, doing some modeling along the way. What clicked or changed for you and had you packing up and leaving for Vancouver to work as an actress? Yeah, I, so before acting, I went to University of Calgary. I got my degree in commerce, uh, specializing in finance. And then I worked in corporate finance and mergers and acquisitions for about six years (laughs) before making the jump. Yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed it. Like I, I had no qualms really with my job. It was dynamic work. It was really interesting. Um, But I always, always loved acting. Um, Like I said, ever since I was young, I just didn't think that it was a viable option for me. One, because I was really shy. And second, I, we don't really see many people like me looking like I do on, on television, right? Like there wasn't a lot of representation at the time. And I think it's really changing, which is fantastic. Um, But having all said that, I was doing um, a course for work, getting um, an accreditation called the CFA. Uh, it's a very demanding course. Um, yes. Constantly studying evenings, weekends, basically whenever you're not working or sleeping. And I, I enjoyed the course. I just was really needing something for myself outside of the profession and all of that. Um, so I decided to take an acting class because I remembered how much I loved it. And I fell deeply in love with it again. <laughs> and it was just this tipping point of like, look, I, it's always been in the back of my head. If I'm going to do it, I have to do it now or I should do it now. Um, and so I took a leave of absence. I packed my car and I drove to Vancouver and 
luckily it worked out. I tell you, Vancouver is is certainly becoming one of the, the film capitals of the world these days. In 2015, you starred in Single and Dating in Vancouver, and it teases this idea about how hard it is to meet people in Vancouver. Having spent a lot more time there, do you find that premise to be true? What do you like and dislike about the city? There is this, I guess, perception of Vancouver that it's really hard to break into social circles here, and I definitely see part of that. And I, I suppose that has to do with just the way, in my opinion, anyway, um, it, it's the thing that I love about the city, but also I can see how it kind of creates these bubbles of social circles is that there's really defining characteristics um, in pers- like in parts of the city, right? So you get one part of the city that has like a defined kind of lifestyle group and then the other part. And I don't know if many of it mixes because people just tend not to go out of those certain areas. And I think maybe mm-hmm. that's what it is. But a joke that I always made (laughs) is because people who are born and raised in Vancouver are rare. Um, I found it easy to meet people because there's a lot of people coming into Vancouver looking for the same thing. Um, And luckily, I had a couple friends here already, so they were able to introduce me to some people. But yeah, I heard horror stories, if I can say, about dating in Vancouver, where it's just like, I guess, really tough. Luckily, I I haven't had to deal with that. But um, yeah, it, it's been fine. But I always made the joke, too, that, like, I'm from Alberta, from Calgary, moving over here. And most of my friends that I met in Vancouver are also from Alberta. And I'm like, I think we give off a smell or something because we just seem to find each other. <laughs> That's hilarious. But but it's good, though. I mean, because then you have, you know, you have common ground. And certainly yeah, totally. you can have that, that friendship in Vancouver. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Been very fortunate that way. Being a bit of a foodie, I have to ask, what are your top two or three places to eat in Vancouver? Oh, ooh. okay. Yes. There's so many good places to eat in Vancouver. Um, one place that uh, Tai Ma, who plays Jin on Kung Fu, uh, introduced us to, there's this really fantastic Chinese restaurant called Cindy's Palace that has delicious dim sum and just all around like really, really good, authentic Chinese food. I love this um, place called Doche, which is a vegan um, restaurant um, that has like Southeast Asian influences on it. Oh, so delicious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And I mean, I have to just say blanket statement. You cannot go wrong with sushi in Vancouver. (laughs) So good. So good. But uh, I could go on. We could have a whole hour episode just on that if you really wanted. We, We might have to. Because, I mean, you're making me hungry right now, so. Oh, me too. (laughs) Street Legal is one of the longest-running scripted shows in Canadian television history, a legal drama series. And you got to be part of the 2019 revival. As one of your first big roles, what was that experience like for you, and what lessons did you learn that have helped you in your career? Oh, it was, it was so great to be on, on that show and um, really celebrating Canadian television. Um, it was, yeah, it was one of the, before Heartland, it was the longest uh, dramatic series that ran in, in Canada on air for CBC. And to be part of that revival, that nostalgia, and having heard from some of the fans of the original series was really, really special. Um, And for me, at that point, I mean, what people don't see is all the stuff behind the scenes, right? And at that point, I had been quite close to a few different roles for a series regular lead um, on on different projects, and it just wasn't happening for me, and this was my first one. So for it to be this project, being Canadian, um, and celebrating that meant a lot. It felt like it was supposed to be that project. Many folks are probably familiar with the 1972 Kung Fu series starring David Carradine, and it had its place in history. However, uh, it also was extremely controversial with its casting decisions, representation of women, different ethnic groups, and even the notion that the idea may have been stolen from Bruce Lee, and he wasn't even involved in the production, Talk to me about the new Kung Fu series created by Christina Kim. It's a reimagining, not a reboot, 
what makes the series special, and most importantly, what has been done to fix those past wrongs and be more representative? Well, first, thank you for saying that, because it is. It's a reimagining. It's not a reboot of the of series. We stand alone, I think, in, in the reimagining of it and what it represents. Um, however, saying that, I think we do bring that spirit of the original series of, of the fighting and what people really loved about that, not having forgotten about that. But in the reimagining, like you said, I really commend the showrunner, Christina Kim, for making sure that authenticity is such a huge part of the show and for putting and creating these wonderful female strong leads um having them have these rich stories to tell in the show and being the badasses they are that's what's groundbreaking i think for for me is to be able for us to see that and take ownership of that and take it back actually take back what what we should have had in the first place, I think, in the reboot, if I may say, or not the reboot, the, the original series, if I may say. Um, so that is incredibly gratifying for it to, to be corrected, in my opinion. There's also a, a really strong philosophy that goes into Kung Fu. Were you a Bruce Lee fan growing up? And did you watch a lot of martial arts films? I watched a lot of Jackie Chan. And I watched, um, I watched some of Bruce Lee. Yeah, another, another wonderful one. I mean, I remember actually um, meeting him briefly when he was filming Shanghai Noon in Canada, in, in Calgary. I think it was Calgary and Alberta that they were doing that with uh, Owen Wilson, right? And yeah, oh, wow. we just, he was, he's an icon. Um, to see him fighting and, and to take on these, these roles and to have the humor and also the heartbreaking scenes that he's able to do, the man could do it all. So it was, uh, it was really it was great to have him growing up and seeing that as a role model. And um, Bruce Lee, of course, he's, he's always, he's an icon, he's such an iconic figure. And um, both have had in, influenced my career hugely. Your character is the main baddie in the show. Uh, <laughs> yeah. How would you describe her and her motives, especially around the eight sacred weapons? Mm -hmm. I think for season one, how I describe her is she's quite a dynamic individual in the sense that she's both vile, but heartbreaking at times, uh, ruthless, but also very um, introspective in a lot of ways. I mean, you, you can see that there's always something kind of percolating underneath the surface with her. So she'll only give so much to people because that's all that they need to know. But there's so much more depth and levels to her. Um, that we did see in season one. Um, thankfully, again, to Christina Kim and Bob Barrett, showrunners of the show, that they were given that to me as an actor as such a joy to play. Um, she was not just a surface level caricature of what a villain should be. She was very much a human being and, you know, a hero of her own story. Um, season two, there's a lot of discovery for her. Um, she is on this path of finding a different way to be. Um, because no spoiler alerts for those who haven't seen season one, but at the end of season one, she's quite defeated, so to speak. And then coming into season two, we see her again in that mode of trying to figure out, well, what's her purpose now? Because she lost everything um, prior to. And so we, we see a completely different version of Jalan in season two than we do in season one. I love the show. Um, the cinematography and production design are just gorgeous. And most important, especially in doing a show called Kung Fu, you have to make sure the fight choreography is on point. How intense has your fight training been? And do you enjoy the physical demands of the show? I love the physical demands of the show. Um, like I, I'm a fitness junkie. I, I like all that physicality. So it is a joy for me to do that. And the stunt team is, oh, they're just wonderful. Like they're, they are amazing martial artists, fantastic trainers, um, really great mentors in all of it. They keep us safe. They keep us up to speed on all this. And like, they just, the choreography is so linked in and intertwined with the story that as actors, 
in, in the moves, you feel the emotionality of it as well. So they're really mindful of keeping that open dialogue between cast and crew and seeing what works well best for, to serve the story. And I think that's really what the winning ticket is and what people are seeing is that these fights are just fighting for the sake of fighting. They're really intertwined into the emotional aspects of the characters as well. You see a lot of actors, particularly on multi-season running shows, get in the director's chair for an episode or two or more. I've seen some directorial things on your Instagram page. Is that something you would be interested in doing, if asked? I would love to. I don't, I, I feel for me that I, <laughs> I'm a person who I don't want to take something on yet until I really feel that I could give what the show really deserves, so to speak. Um, so luckily this season, uh, they were really gracious and allowed me to shadow direct um, Joe Menendez, who is the producer director of our show. And he is amazing. He directed the first two episodes, um, of season two. And he's also directed episode eight and episode, uh, the, the finale of the show of the season. And he's wonderful. He he's like, as a director, he's fantastic. And so to be able to just be behind him and ask questions for, um, for an episode, just to learn from him has been really great. Um, I'm going to take that knowledge with me and just keep practicing and keep doing, you know, my own projects and stuff. And if one day I, I am good enough and I feel ready to, to take on the director's chair of maybe Kung Fu or something else, I would absolutely love to. And yes, that is something that I have my eyes on. It's going to happen. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was really excited to also hear that you're going to be a part of the live action adaptation of the beloved animated series, Avatar, The Last Airbender, yeah. and playing one of the most powerful avatars at that. How did you get connected to the project and what can you tell us about your character? So Michael Goy, who is the director producer of Avatar, um, he was a director of episode seven in season one of Kung Fu. So that's how we connected. Oh. Yeah. And then I, as I was filming uh, season two of Kung Fu, he reached out, he said, hey, I'm on Avatar right now. I have a role that I think you'd be absolutely perfect for. Are you available to do it? I'm like, if it's Michael, yes, because he is incredible. Like this man, his directing style, his, his eye and vision for things is unreal. Um, so I said, yeah, absolutely. And then he's like, okay, it's Avatar Kyoshi. <laughs> And I was thrilled because I love her. I love, love, love her. I'm a fan of, a huge fan of the original anime. Um, and I, I just couldn't believe that that's the one that I was being called for. Um, I will say, and I can't say very much uh, for that project, but I will say from what I've seen and my experience on the show, the fans of Avatar, The Last Airbender, will not be disappointed with this live action series it looks phenomenal that's good to hear that's yeah. really good to hear especially you know it was really unfortunate about the m night Shyamalan film version he's even come out and said he was disappointed in it as well so mm -hmm. lots of fans are going to be excited about this but there's also a lot of pressure i would assume because with the popularity of the kiyoshi books have you felt any of the pressure to kind of get her story and character right? Oh, definitely. Definitely. I love the Kyoshi books. So addicted to those and her backstory and just everything about this character is so beautifully written um, and really thoughtful. And she just has one of the most fascinating stories of any character that I've read. So I do definitely felt the pressure of being able to, to bring her to life and, and hopefully the fans who I know that there are a lot of them would respond in a really positive way. But again, it, it, luckily, you know, it's not just me at the helm. It's, it's a, a team of people really wanting to get this right. And I hope we did. <laughs> I, I think exciting. we did. Yeah. Super exciting. Yvonne, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us here on Everything Zen. Congrats on kicking butt in Kung Fu and mastering all of the elements in Last Airbender. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. This is a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. You can catch Yvonne Chapman on Season 2 of Kung Fu, airing right now on The CW, with episodes streaming weekly on CWTV.com. And Season 1 of Kung Fu is available in its entirety 
on HBO Max. You can also catch Yvonne on Global TV's Family Law series on GlobalTV.com as she returns later this year for Season 2. And lastly, the visuals look stunning already, and Yvonne is going to absolutely crush it as Avatar Kyoshi. So don't forget to set your reminders for The Last Airbender, tentatively set for a late 2022, early 2023 release on Netflix.